Welcome to Virtual Worship with Northley United. Our mission at Northley is to love God, nurture the Spirit, connect with others, and serve the world. Thank you for joining us in worship. To learn more about us, visit our website at northleyunited.ca. As one week finishes and another week begins, we have come to worship together, placing ourselves, our lives, our loved ones, and all our cares and joys in the embrace of God, whose welcome is always assured. Together, now, let us worship God. Good morning. Welcome to Northley United's virtual worship service. At this time, let us acknowledge that we are worshipping on the ancestral land of many First Nations peoples. We live, work, play and pray on Treaty 13 lands. May we live in harmony and respect with all those who share the earth with us and be thankful to God as we move into a peaceful and healthy future together. On November the 27th, 28 former Afghan women MPs and senators, currently living in exile in Athens, Greece, 
formally launched the Afghan Women's Parliament in exile. It was their frustration at having been silenced and then hunted by the Taliban that led to their decision to launch the parliament. They feel that they still wear the mantle of leadership, even if they are thousands of miles away from home and the people they serve. From Athens, the group's mission is to continue to advocate for Afghans, particularly Afghan women, and bring pressure to bear on world leaders. With their vast experience in policymaking and governance, they also want to be in a position to advise the international community on how best to address Afghanistan and its future. As MP Naziva Beck stated, our work is not done. We were elected by the Afghan people to represent them. Our people, especially women and girls, and those living in poverty, are facing a severe humanitarian crisis and a crackdown on their rights by the Taliban. We will continue to serve them wherever they are. Despite losing everything and at considerable danger to their safety, Afghan women are still leading both inside Afghanistan and in exile. It is in this courage to speak up and advocate for those who are being silenced that we see the light of Christ. May the light of Christ shine brightly in places of darkness, illuminating the beauty, truth and grace that may be hidden in the shadows, but always and forever present. The light of Christ. Let us pray. You never hesitate, O God, to show us your goodness and mercy, your love and grace. You are open to all our prayers, always ready to receive and answer. Touch our hearts during this time of worship. Fill us with the golden light of your presence. And as we receive your word, and pray and listen. Make us one in Christ, we pray. Amen. And now, Prince, we listen to this reading that comes to us from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. And we pray that God's voice will speak to us in this reading. It's a portion of scripture where Jesus is rejected at Nazareth familiar story. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. A reading according to the Gospel of Luke. So what is the Gospel saying to you and to me today? Let the words of my mouth, coupled with the meditation of each one of our hearts, be acceptable in the sight of our Lord this day. Amen. Today, I want you to look with me, friends, as we examine the words coming to us from the Gospel of Luke. It's a piece of scripture that describes the homecoming of Jesus to the town of Nazareth and his subsequent subsequent rejection by them. 
As our gospel lesson opens, it states, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I personally have had the pleasure and privilege of visiting the Holy Land. And I've had the opportunity to stand and reflect on what this piece of scripture says today and where this drama unfolded. As I was getting ready for the sermon for today, I sat still and tried to put myself back in that moment back when I was in the Holy Land. All the thoughts and emotions that must have been evoked as Jesus returned to his hometown where he had been raised and nurtured, I tried to get into the moment as best I knew how. It's fairly well accepted by scholars that Father Joseph had died, which is one of the reasons they claim that Jesus had not started his ministry until he was 30. It was here in Nazareth that Jesus worked alongside his dad, laboring in their carpenter shop. He most likely, being the eldest, had to assume responsibility for the business and then train his brothers to take over the shop. I believe it was here that Jesus attended Nazareth Synagogue School. I believe it was here that Jesus brought the family tithe to God's house every Sabbath. We know that Jesus had worshipped in other places during his absence, but this was his special place. It was here that he first learned the Hebrew language necessary to read the sacred scrolls. It was here that he grew from a mere lad into full manhood. However, Jesus' soul had been stirred by the reports of one called John the Baptizer. He was out in the wilderness, and John and Jesus met. Jesus went to hear John, and he baptized him in the River Jordan. When Jesus left Nazareth, he was a citizen of the town. When he returned, he returned with another identity and mission. He returned as savior to the world. Behind him now was baptism and wrestling with Satan in the desert. Everything had to change for him when he set foot that day in Nazareth. It was here he would announce the platform of the kingdom and mission that was given to him. Jesus announces his new mission right here in the synagogue among those he knew. However, one word changes the environmental acceptance to ones of rejection. We know that news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. We know he taught in their synagogues and everybody praised him. I believe there was a curiosity about Jesus' identity already present in this gathering when he arrives at the local house of worship. Jesus picked up the scrolls and read a lesson from the great prophet Isaiah. He talked about social justice. He talked about freedom from oppression and healing and restoration. And everybody was smiling from ear to ear. They must have looked like a proud people who had swallowed a banana sideways. They were so excited and pleased for him. It was good to have a young person involved in the congregation at the synagogue. However, we know that Jesus had just returned from his battle with the powers of evil. He had faced the devil eyeball to eyeball. So that is our first clue that this is not business as usual. Jesus was going to relate religious faith to the realities of life and liberty. In verse 21, he looks at the people and he says, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Methodists 
spiritual founder and mentor John Wesley, he became greatly concerned about the spiritual demise and climate of the church and its inability to reach the masses of people who were locked out of the church. Wesley wanted to reform the church and he was determined to relate the religious faith to the cruel realities of life for so many people. The Methodist movement began when 4,000 miners gathered to hear a small man with a shrill voice proclaim, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. There's a big difference between being acquainted with Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus the Christ. The real tragedy to me is that the last time I checked, the Christian church was called to share Jesus Christ as bread for the world. And so I ask myself, are we doing that? today? You see, I think it's always easier to have a someday mentality. You can have discipleship without discipline. You can have success without suffering. You can have glory which detours around Golgotha. You can have a crown without a cross. You see, there's a big difference between observing history and making history. There is a big difference between being a respectful admirer of God and being a committed believer. Did Jesus say to the man who was beside the pool, sick for 38 years, par par paralyzed, did Jesus look at the man and say, would you like to be healed someday? Did Jesus look at Zacchaeus up in the tree and say, I'd like to stay at your home someday? When Jesus was passing the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Peter, did he say, would you please consider following me someday? During a war, a young man came to the general in charge and said, I want you to know that I believe in you and your cause. I fully support you. The general thanked him and asked, what regiment are you in? Under whose command do you serve? What uniform do you wear? Oh, said the young man, I'm not in the army, I'm just a civilian. The general replied, young man, if you believe in me and my cause, then you will go and join the army. You will put on a uniform, you get yourself a rifle and you will fight. That's the same challenge Jesus offers to you and me today, friends. He's not interested in sympathizers. He wants followers. For this kind of commitment that leads to a worthwhile and satisfying life. The civilian wanted to be an admirer. The civilian might have wanted to join someday. But scripture jumps off the page to you and to me and says, Jesus wants it all to happen today. He wasn't rejected at Nazareth because he said someday. He was rejected because he said today. Were the people listening? It was that day in Nazareth that they discovered Jesus would not be a local hero. They would also be called to repent. And so are we today. Martin Luther King wasn't killed because he had a dream. It was because he couldn't just be a dreamer. But the dream he had had to become a reality today, not someday. Gandhi wasn't beaten, tortured, jailed, and eventually killed because he said someday. But because he said today. 
Liberation is not a one-time happening, but an ongoing historical process that the church must be aware of today. Where is the place, friends, in your life and your journey where God is calling you to respond by declaring today, not someday? Think about it. The Spirit of the Lord is talking to you. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind? And now, friends, it's time for you to respond to the message spoken to you today. The question is, how shall we respond? It's between you and your understanding of God and what God asks of you. So I ask that Creator God accept the gifts we offer with our love and gratitude and say thank you for all God gives us. Guided by God's Spirit, may we do his work, do his will to further the work of Jesus, that the compassion and justice in our world be observed by all. Amen. And now, family and friends, it's your turn. God wants to talk to you. He wants to know that you've listened to what he had to say today. And now he wants to know how you'll respond. Let us bow together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, who indeed has come into our midst because we called upon your name and asked you through the power of the Spirit to be with us in this time, in this place, in this understanding of your word. Week after week, we come and we listen to what is written in the Holy Bible. We listen and we appreciate. But I think most of us go home thinking that 
you know, someday I'm going to sit down and really think about that. Someday I might just respond in a new way, but not today. Jesus looks at us disappointed, disillusioned, and wants to ask us why we ask him for so much, and yet we can't give so little. How can we, day after day, week after week, year after year, pray that God will help us enjoy the good life? When God asks us something so simple, believe. That's all he wants, just believe. And we say, someday, yeah, we will. Why can't it be today, friends? Why can't we take a moment to shut off the world around us? Why can't we take a moment to understand how easy it is to incorporate our faith into our daily living? God knows. God knows that we are able. The question is, are we willing? We come. We come before God in this time and this place, and we ask for the gift of God's presence, both in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Now it's our turn. God says, you called upon me and here I am. But now I have called your name, God says. Can you reply, here I am? Think on it. Think on it and prepare yourself to dedicate the rest of your life into living your faith as you best understand it. And God will smile and bless those around us and all our days. Be ready. Be ready and know that God is indeed with us. For we call upon his name and ask for the gift of his presence. And we say together the prayer Jesus taught all believers to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us away from temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mine.
So now, family and friends, we go from this place, knowing that the Spirit of Christ is upon you to proclaim the good news. Go, anointed, inspired, and commissioned to live in the way of Christ. Go with the Father, the Son, and the power of the Spirit. Amen.